Um, because in the, in the financial field, I was not a leader. I, I was a critic. Uh, as contrast to most people, let's say, who count in the, in the uh, financial sector. Uh, I was always a loner, and, and, and my role was that of a critic of the system, not, 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 not a leader within, within the system. Uh, in fact, I, I, I pride myself on being the highest paid critic in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but how did you, what lessons did you learn about how to succeed versus how one fails and the role of critic? Obviously, your criticism was intended to bring change. No. Uh, uh, my criticism had a philosophical foundation, right. which is the same as the foundation of an open society, the recognition, you know, of, of our fallibility and, and, and uh, the, the, the fact that uh, most concepts or most trends have a flaw. Uh, so you can recognize the trend and then you can recognize the flaw within the trend then you are definitely ahead of, of, of the game. And that was really the, the key uh, to, my, to my approach. Yeah, I, yeah. thanks. If, if we think about the notion of reflexivity, for example, yeah. I would think that that is, is an example of sort of conceptual leadership, I would think. I mean, the question is, of course, how do you actually transmit it to the uh, you know, economics discipline? Because certainly it's, you know, yeah, I wasn't transmitting it. I was practicing it. Uh, right. you, you know, I wanted to transmit it as uh, a philosophical concept, and and then I uh, uh, happened on the financial markets as a as a laboratory in which to test uh, the, the the idea. So I tested it, and uh, and then of course I had a sort of a a final flourish as a, as a, as a fund manager uh, recording my test in, in the form of, which then became part of a book, yeah. the, my, which was the first book, The Alchemy of Finance, you see. So that was, in a way, my, uh, I would say, that my uh, final flourish uh, as, a, as a fund manager. And, and in fact, I, I, uh, the, the challenge of recording it and using it as a demonstration of uh, uh, my uh, theory kind of gave me the interest that contributed to the success of the experiment. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it came together there. And, and uh, uh, shortly after that, I kind of phased out of the, the uh, uh, real uh, fund management business. But wh what was the next step after the fund management? I, I want to bring you over to the public uh, thing. The public thing. Yeah. Uh, so, so um, uh, I mean, the alchemy of finance was an attempt to communicate a philosophy. Uh, uh, and I it was the theory of reflexivity uh, and um, uh, uh, so that was that. Uh, I started, I set up the, my foundation a little bit before that. It was, uh, I set it up in, in 79, 1979. Uh, and I wrote the book in 84, 85. Uh, and uh, then I was getting more and more involved in experimenting in what, what can one do with, with, the, with, the, with the foundation. Um, but at, at, at that point, uh, I had made a deliberate um, uh, choice not to put my ego I into the foundation. And it was at that time my my idea was <coughs> that 
uh, if a philanthropy is meant to serve a, a goal, then it should not serve the ego mm -hmm. of, of the donor. So the, 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 you, you've got to consciously uh, the, divorce yourself from the work of the foundation. How did you do that? Pardon? How did you do that? By, by um, uh, being faceless and, and anonymous in, in, in my activities. Uh, and uh, basically, um, I was uh, helping um, uh, dissidents who were on the line. So it was really their show, and they were the ones who were taking the risks, and I was really merely providing some uh, material support. Uh, and my first, let's say, uh, major effort that did not involve uh, uh, dissidents was in South Africa, uh, where I went in 1980, 81, 82, and I set up scholarships, open society scholarships, in, 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 so that, that was also a kind of a passive, passive role. Um, and I, I started negotiating with the Hungarian authorities about setting up a foundation in Hungary in, uh, in 84. And in fact, we set up the foundation in Hungary in 84. But there again, you see, I was sort of behind the scenes. And, um, and then I, I extended my, my activities in um, uh, China and Poland and other places. And since the changeover from communism was in various uh, stages, uh, publicity would have killed me in my activities, you see, because certain things that could be said in one country mm -hmm. uh, couldn't be said in another country. Uh, so so um, uh, keeping quiet was very, very important. And I, I remember when the first, uh, <coughs> first um, um, uh, article appeared in one of the U.S. news or whatever, it, it annoyed me because it blew my cover. <laughs> it, 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 it exposed me and the people <laughs> whom I'm trying to help. Uh, uh, then uh, sort of came the, uh, uh, the um, collapse of the Soviet system and I became increasingly personally involved in, in Hungary, in Poland, uh, <coughs> you know, started, you know, me, uh, traveling there, uh, meeting <coughs> with the leaders, uh, you know, when I set up the foundation in Poland, that was in 80, 89, for instance, I had a meeting with Jaruzelski, that kind of I think moved him a little bit to to open up a, a, a discussion with solidarity. But by that time, I knew the leaders of solidarity. So and then Russia, and then, and then really when I went to Russia in uh, <coughs> um, in eighty seven, actually, when when. Um, uh, Gorbachev called Sakharov and said, return to Moscow. I took that as a signal that, you know, that he wasn't pushed out of Russia, but he was allowed to go back to, to, to Moscow. Uh, that's when I went to, to Russia, and that's, that's when I really <coughs> became uh, uh, very much engaged. And, and, uh, and also, that's when I found someone else to run my business. Mm -hmm. uh, so I could disengage from my business and, and engage in that. So the, 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 the changeover was between 87 and 89. That's when you disengaged from your business? Dis then I disengaged from my business. In fact, the man whom I found uh, uh, said to me that I really can't do it with you around here. You know, I, 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 and, and so I said, I mean, he basically was ready to, to quit. 
and I said to him, no, no, you stay and I quit. <laughs> and so, so we then developed a very good uh, working relationship where he became the, uh, the, uh, uh, the champion and I was his trainer or, or, you know, I was in his corner. But he was the one who was uh, in the ring. Mm. Uh, and so that worked very well and that was a wonderful uh, partnership for until quite recently. Uh, mm. So that helped me because that gave that gave me the platform you see of of, of um, having a, a successful hedge fund he was he continued the the performance and he had, he had a very good performance so i that gave me the platform uh, which allowed me to to grandstand as a you know uh, man of finance uh, <laughs> 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 with, 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 with somebody else doing the work. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean to pry, but did it also mean did it also provide you with a continuing source of absolutely. generated wealth? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wealth. So I, I used uh, I used the income then to to, to 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 I was more involved with spending it than than yeah, with making right, with making right, it. Right. But you had accumulated yeah. wealth, and plus plus you had this new. Infusion of money coming through, right, right, which which helped you a great deal. It gave you that, also gave you a financial platform. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Right, so right. it was a really a very fortunate uh, 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 sort of. Uh, and what have you called yourself when you think of yourself since '89? What do you think of yourself as a philanthropist? Statesman? Well, no, I actually, uh, if, uh, philanthropist is a bit of a misnomer because yeah. uh, because. Uh, uh, well, I'm a stateless statesman. Stateless I, statesman. I, I think that's probably. I a, found a, that phrase here. Yeah, yeah. I think that I like that. Uh, and this came from a from a, a prime minister of Macedonia, who at the time was a young man, and I think was well-meaning. He later became very corrupt, and like all the others. Mm -hmm. But he said, you know, uh, you are a stateless statesman because uh, 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 states have. Uh, have uh, interests but no principles, and you have principles but no interests. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so play on the old Kissinger line. Right, right. Yeah, right. So I, that hit home. You know? <laughs> so I, I, I accept I, that. I, 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 I understand. Now, tell me, as you went down this path, what counsel do you have for other people out of the business community who want to work with governments or work with emerging leaders? about how to be effective at this. Mm -hmm. People, you know, you've been this, uh, 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 you've had this unique role, but what has worked best for you? Well, I, I, do, th I do think that my position is, is a bit unique, so yeah. I don't think it really quite applies right. to other businessmen. Uh, but I, I do also run into a lot of businessmen who, who um, genuinely uh, want to make a contribution to society. Right. And I think there's a new breed, particularly connected with technology. Uh, I mean, the, the internet uh, billionaires, if, if they are billionaires, if they manage to <laughs> sell out in time or whatever. Right. Um, I think have a have a, a, a real contribution to make uh, because they bring a sort of a creative, uh, not not just business um, uh, approach, but a, a sort of creativity. In other words, uh, uh, it's not a zero sum game. Uh, uh, it's not uh, you know not a matter of haggling or or uh, it's a matter of creating, uh, and they were rewarded for that in in, in business, and uh, uh, are sort of ready to apply that. Uh, I, I do run into them. Hmm. Hmm. And but I, I want to go back to, to what, what the works. advice. Yeah, what, what works. Well, I know it's case by case. It is really case by case. Uh, I mean, I, there's one man who, who, who somebody uh, we invested some money with. He sold out the company, uh, and then he set up uh, a uh, an organization called 
uh, eduk.r. Uh, he originally came from Argentina and he had set up a uh, foundation to provide a uh, curriculum on the, on the internet instead of textbooks. And that's a, that's a, a viable business. You know, as you save on the textbook, that pays for uh, for the preparation of the curriculum and the. the I mean, that's a, that's a, as, 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 that's really a social invention. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's not doing so well now <laughs> because of Argentina. But for instance, I tried to uh, move that into uh, Russia, mm -hmm. you know, because it could. So, I mean, that's, that's invention. I mean, that's innovation. Uh, and so there is room for social, in, in, uh, social uh, entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to be uh, uh, very leery of it. Uh, I had the position that you really can't combine making money with, with giving money away, because you mess up both. Uh, they, they interfere with each other. The, the, the uh, uh, business is efficient because you have a single criterion, which is the bottom line, that right. tells you what the performance is. And the social entrepreneurship is, is a different, is a more, it's a, it's a more difficult a task because you have different lines because different people are affected mm -hmm. differently and you actually can't add it to, together mm -hmm. because you've got all kinds of unintended consequences that you can't really measure one against the other mm -hmm. because you know what you do to one group of people uh, ca cannot be offset uh, 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 what uh, what you do for others so uh, um, because of that, I used to be leery of it. I've changed my view. Uh, I, I think it's a much more difficult uh, enterprise than private enterprise, but that's a good reason for, it's a, it's a greater challenge. Mm -hmm. And therefore, success should be more highly respected because it's, it was more difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I think when you look at uh, you know let's say uh, um, uh, microcredit, which was uh, invented in in Bangladesh, uh, I think it's a it's a great it's a great invention. So um, is the, the the probably the number one example of social entrepreneurship in the world. Right. right. Yeah. Now, you know, Grameen Bank itself has run into some difficulties, like uh, any uh, business, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as the, the entrepreneur uh, ages or whatever, or the business becomes too big, uh, uh, you run into difficulties. So did, so did uh, uh, Grameen Bank. Uh, but it is a great uh, uh, a s a social invention. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, this is this is, for instance, one very important area where uh, uh, entrepreneurs can make a contribution. Right. But now you've gone a different direction. You've made your money over here and taken and the money there into a different. And I, I try to keep it entirely separate right. uh, because of the because of the inherent um, the conflicts. Right. Uh, so d d mine was you make it and you give it away. And that in a way is, uh, if you like, is old fashioned philanthropy. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's what uh, Carnegie did mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's what Gates is doing and so on. So it's actually the old fashioned stuff. And there is uh, this more innovative uh, thing where you actually invent uh, uh, social mechanisms that, that work for society right. and are self-sustaining. Uh, self right. Now, t that's what I'd like to ask. Yeah. T t yeah. Tell me about those. And well, I, I don't know too much about them because yeah, that's not what I do. And in fact, 
In fact, uh, we made it a rule uh, not to consider inventions. Mm -hmm. Actually, we had a, you know, when we set up the foundation in Hungary, we advertised that you know inventions will not be considered because we didn't we were not set up for it and and the foundation of of my uh, kind is actually ill suited for th th this kind of activity we we do get involved in it and, and we usually fail i mean you don't you don't have inventions within the foundation no what we do actually uh, um, get involved. For instance, we were pioneers in internet. Uh, we, we, we started introducing internet <coughs> in uh, the countries where the foundations operated in 89, 90, uh, when internet was, before internet really uh, uh, became um, as widespread as it is, before it became commercialized, actually. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it's a funny thing because actually I lost, I, I missed the, the business aspect of it. I, I, was, I, was, uh, I was an investor in a company called Bolt Baranek and Newman here in Boston, which was the, uh, the designer of uh, ARPANET, which was, then became Internet. Uh, but then I didn't actually uh, do very much on the commercial side and I spent large amounts of money introducing it and uh, the introduction uh, had uh, sort of a business uh, part of it so or business potential so uh, for instance we spent large amount of money in Romania in providing connectivity and then, and then uh, service and, and so on. And eventually we hived it off and sold it uh, for peanuts. Uh, so as a business, it didn't flourish. It, it, if we had looked at it as a business, we could have, with that money, we could have really done something. Right. So it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't mix uh, very well the the um, foundation mentality right. with the with business mentality right. and that's why an entrepreneur let's say who who uh, let's say conceptually uh, starts it as an enterprise can be more successful than a foundation uh, that tries to create something that becomes self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. mm. I understand. So the, <coughs> the foundations you set up, mm -hmm. so you set up one in Poland, you set up another yeah. one in Hungary, right. and they were locally based, right. and they were run primarily by whom? By uh, the, the, uh, the, the formula is uh, a local board and the local executive director and local staff. In some countries <coughs> that, um, that um, where conditions are too, so that's okay. That are where corruption is too endemic. They need an external executive director for protection. Because they can't protect themselves, not so much against the state or the authorities, but against their friends. Uh, <laughs> so you need an, a, a foreign uh, presence in, in Central Asia, for instance. Mm. But in, the, in, in, the, in Russia also. In, uh, uh, but the idea is that, that it should be people in the country who share the objectives of uh, uh, open society, who then uh, design the strategy and start the programs. And, and, and most of the successful programs were started by people in the foundations and I didn't necessarily know about it. 
uh, uh, so it's a certain degree of, of uh, autonomy. <coughs> but uh, the, the people in the foundations are not businessmen. They are, tend to be intellectuals, uh, professors, uh, uh, publicists, and so on. So uh, they, they, all they know is to give money away, but they don't know how to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you judge the success <coughs> of your foundations? How do you know whether it's doing good work? It's, it's entirely intuitive. There is no, uh, there is no criterion. Uh, we have, uh, as we became bureaucratized, uh, we have all kinds of evaluation uh, things. I actually don't uh, uh, look at it that way, uh, and it's it's uh, it's really is an intuitive uh, thing because you can't. I, I don't think that that. Um, I mean, I, uh, we, we have a method, I have a method of rating the, the foundations, and, and I have a uh, um, mission, um, impact, and efficiency as the three criteria. And they're not, they're not actually identical, because you may have uh, uh, a great sense of mission without having you know, much impact, and, 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 and you can be very efficient, or you can have a big impact without being efficient. So it, it, there are, even, even conceptually, you've got more than one criterion by which to judge. And the, the reason for that is that, that in business, your objective is to, to be successful. Whereas in uh, this field of um, you know, social justice or whatever, uh, social concern, uh, you have to fight losing battles. And, and losing battles is, is the winning strategy. Uh, so um, the less successful you are, let's say, the less impact you make, or the, the more you need to do it in certain circumstances. If you, if you are up against, let's say, an oppressive regime, um, standing, uh, standing up against that regime is very important even though you end up in jail or uh, lose your life or, or, or whatever. As long as you've got people willing to fight losing battles, uh, you know, freedom is not lost. So, so it's, um, you don't have success as the criterion, hmm. because you really have to have... Hmm? Hmm? I think it's interesting because the, the, the philosophy, the unifying philosophy is, is the idea of the open society. Yeah. And, uh, I think the central challenge is how do you transmit that in an organization? Because it's a decentralized organization. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly it's very, and you give them a lot of autonomy, mm. and clearly it's, it's crucial that everyone really, you know, internalizes this mission, this mm. idea, this philosophy of the open society. And then clearly your being visible plays an important, your leadership role plays an mm. important role in spreading this message and this philosophy. But we'd be, of course, more interested also in the mechanisms. How do you actually do this? How do you get this to work? Well, it, 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 um, uh, we are facing that I issue. You know, in other words, uh, our success uh, uh, really consisted of uh, people committed mm -hmm. to, 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 a set, to a set of ideas, uh, combined with a donor who who uh, gave them their head and, and uh, 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 supported them uh, in what they were trying to do, not in what he was trying to do. Mm. So it's, it's, that was very important. Uh, and the supplier, so the supply of money, 
And I think now where we are also, I guess, my persona. I mean, I, uh, I, should, I do not underestimate, uh, you know, my personal uh, charismatic uh, uh, role. Now, we have to adjust our, for the future. We, we are currently at this, at this strategic uh, uh, decision point. Uh, because we have to prepare for less money, because I've stopped making money. My money-making days are over. So uh, we now have a certain amount of money, but that uh, cannot sustain the present level of, 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 of funding. So we have to, f to cut the funding by half. Hmm. Um, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big task. So we have to do, do it with less money, and eventually we also have to think of, you know, without me. Right? So um, I'm not sure whether the, uh, anything will remain, um, and, but I'm willing to give it a try to, to reform uh, the foundation, and um, we are now in the process of trying to implement that in uh, the countries which are uh, um, candidates for membership in the European Union, because they, they, their funding should phase out. So I'm cutting them off as of, 19, uh, as, as of 2004. Uh, and uh, we are now, they have to design a strategy uh, for, to decide what should remain. And also an, another very important value of, of, of the network is that it's a network. In other words, that people connect, you see, that we've got a foundation, but they interrelate with the other foundations. So the, the networking aspect is an important uh, apart. So how can one maintain that network when you cut the, the, um, and uh, uh, my concept is to unbundle the activities of, of the foundation. So we have, from a network, I want to take it into a network of networks so that uh, the, the various activities that we support can form their own uh, 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 networks. So let's say we're working with the mentally retarded, let's say this, or, or uh, 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 you know, um, uh, human rights or whatever. Uh, they, ha they can have their own uh, network. Women, we have a network, women's program. So the women, that network can continue. Uh, and, uh, they would have to look for support from other sources than, than, than us. Um, and, but we can contribute some because we have got some money to contribute, but obviously they cannot rely on support from us alone. So you then have these, these network of networks to bring them, th these networks, to bring them together in a network of networks. You need um, something like a a, um, an association, an open society uh, uh, association. That is a membership association, so, it, so it, uh, people belong to it. It's like a bit of an alumni organization, if you like. Uh, uh, people who have been connected with the foundation support uh, the goals of the foundation, and then you have at the center something like a think tank that is concerned with uh, 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 preserving, strengthening open society within the country, helping development of open societies uh, in other countries because that's an important element, and let's say be concerned with uh, global open society that is the international institutions that you need. You know, whether this uh, will happen without the, 
the constant injection of, of, um, of money. It depends on the people. It may work in some countries, it may not work in, 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 in other countries. Uh, the chances of success are not more than 50-50. Uh, but uh, you know, we've got to we've got to um, go there. So, so you, right. so, so your role as a leader is essentially then, on the one hand, being, I would say, a chief encouraging officer, so to speak, someone the guardian of principles that inspires, and at the same time, getting the right structures into place. In a way, setting yeah, getting up, getting the right structures into place, setting up the networks, recruiting the right type of people. Yeah, it's sort of a strategy. I so mean, so it, it, uh, I, I would say that I, I am the strategist, but when it comes to, uh, to the actual uh, implementation, I, I, I've been known not to be the best, uh, uh, you know. On the but, implementation. Uh, well, the, even, even on the strategy. In other words, I'm not an organization man. I'm basically a loner. And I'm a, a, a thinker, uh, but I'm not um, not a leader of men. It's as such, uh, um, and also I'm not definitely not uh, an ad administrative genius. <laughs> uh, so how to structure it? You see, I've never I never knew how to make an organization work. Uh, when I set up the foundation in Hungary, and I'd go there from time to time and to decide that certain things would need to be done, I'd come back and it was done. And I was amazed. How could they do it? You know, I don't know how they did it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> they, they, they were self-starters. Right. So they, 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 that was the uh, that was the spirit, and that was the genius of the foundation that you know people are motivated and they got it done mm. uh, but it, it sounds though you had to have a great deal of self-understanding self self-understanding self you had to know who you were yes you yes. had to know your strengths and your weaknesses yes no I mean you see uh, um, I'm a very critical I mean I'm I am best paid critic right so uh, I should be able to apply that to my own activities. In fact, I, I had a partner uh, in my business, and I, I used to say that um, uh, where we both knew when other other people what, what, what um, when other people were doing something wrong. In other words, we knew we both knew the the flaws. In, in, in the world, but I also knew the flaws in us, <laughs> as opposed to him who thought that we were always right. <laughs> so, so uh, since my theory is that markets basically are always wrong, but most of the time they can validate their, their uh, biases. Um, uh, um, I also know that most of the time I'm wrong, so I'm a, I'm extremely critical person. That is the yeah. that is my my I should say my uh, uh, particular um, uh, characteristic, and it is in fact the philosophy in which, which I fail to kind of get across, which is the this. The, the, the inherent fallibility of our understanding, you know, fertile fallacies and so on, which make history. So it, that's, the, that's my core. That's my... Your core belief is the fallibility. Of my own fallibility. Uh, your own fallibility and society's fallibility. Yes. And then an yes. open society is one which then can correct. Yes. Because it has a feedback system, has a feedback mechanism. Right, right. right which yeah. tells people when things are going badly. Right. right. And so an open correct. society is an imperfect society that holds itself open to improvement because it has a feedback me mechanism. For right. Yeah. And you try to live your own life in the same way. Yeah, yes, yes. With right. a lot of feedback, internal feedback from within yeah. yourself. Yes. yes. On the theory that you're fallible, you're yeah. most yes. wrong. Yes. Most of the time you're wrong. Yeah. And how do you know when to correct? 
Is that intuition? Is, well, is I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, 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 when there's a divergence between what you expect and what happens, right? Then, then you know that you're wrong. Right. So, uh, um, this approach is particularly uh, useful in, uh, let's say, in, market, in, in marketable securities, or because there you have a, a, a pretty immediate feedback. It's less less valuable when it comes to venture capital, uh, and even less um, uh, valuable when it comes to uh, politics. Let's say. Mm-hmm. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. I want to come back to your a couple things. Uh, losing, you said, was often the right strategy, mm. and that comes in a in in a society in which you're in the minority. I assume oh, on an issue. Yes. Yes. Then, if you lose, it, it's it's okay to keep losing if you if you keep the issue alive. Mm. and gradually win people over on the moral argument, I would assume. Right. Or gradually you can mm. win the argument right. if you keep alive. Is that what point you're making? Well, it, 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 the, the point is morality. Right. You see, uh, 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 business or let's say markets are amoral. Morality doesn't come into it. It's a matter of uh, winning. Right? Uh, 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 when it comes to morality, then you've got to believe in some values right, that take precedence over the immediate uh, uh, benefits of uh, that concern you. So, uh, you know, it is, uh, uh, the Christians in the catacombs, right, by their standards, or, you know, with the fact that they were eaten by uh, 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 lions. And for that matter, the guys who flew the 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 planes into the towers uh, in from their perspective they they were winning i mean they were you know they were taking a stance okay we are it's abhorrent uh, to us i mean this is the difficulty that when it comes to belief in right and wrong you may be wrong right so so you may be sacrificing your life for a false uh, uh, um, idea, uh, you know, my particular version of it, which is based on recognizing that you may be wrong, can can protect you against some of the excesses of that. But it is it is a it is a serious problem about morality, mm-hmm. that that it you know you may be just plain wrong in in what you believe in. But if you believe in it. Then you, 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 it has to take precedence over your narrow uh, self interest. And for whatever reason, I think we do have a, a, a need for, for that kind of belief. Because, you know, uh, we are mortal. Uh, you know, you, I mean, death has a lot to do with it. Because, uh, uh, the f- the fact that y- you die, uh, well, uh, there's always a, a, an aspiration for something beyond death. I mean, that's why all religions are somehow uh, focusing on how, uh, life after death mm-hmm. or, or whatever. Uh, so there is a need for for. Uh, uh, for this kind of uh, 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 belief, mm-hmm. and and uh, uh, we as a society have managed to eliminate it. Actually, and uh, we got enough um, feedback from success that that we can just pursue success. But that's a very uh, um, how should I say uh, um, breakable ground? Because because for one thing, if you if you're not successful, uh, it kind of uh, t- pulls the rug from under you. you see? Mm-hmm. So it's great as long as you have you are in the boom phase, but it's very hard to deal with the with the bust <laughs> when it comes. <laughs> 
there are, you, if you get it, come in with your foundation into a society, you, let me go back to this proposition. Okay. You've argued that there are two great causes of poverty. One is bad location and mm -hmm. the other is bad government. Mm -hmm. You can't change the location frequently, but you can change the government. Mm -hmm. What have you found through your foundation work are the most effective ways to, to help move a country, encourage a country, stimulate a country to move from bad government to workable or good mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. to good leadership? Well, uh, one is educating an elite can be very effective in providing uh, the, the ingredients of good government. In other words, uh, uh, people, let's say, in, in Eastern Europe who are educated in uh, abroad go back and then they can bring something. So, or, or in Mexico, let's say, the, the, uh, uh, the changeover was basically by people educated in business schools. Uh, in Chile it was uh, the Chicago school and that wasn't so good, uh, you know, because that's market fundamentalist. But, but uh, that, so that's an important element, I think. Um, um, educating, educating a new elite, uh, it, it can be very uh, powerful. And then you look at when you look at the activities of some of the other old-fashioned foundations, like the Ford Foundation, uh, when I went back to Hungary, uh, some of the people that I worked with were people who had scholarships from the Ford Foundation in the in the fifties mm -hmm. and had been spent some time abroad. They they might be in the they might have been in the a communist hierarchy, see, but nevertheless, that was a very good basis. So I, I think uh, educating an elite is, is, it's a long, you know, that's a generational thing, but that I think is very, uh, uh, very important. We, we, f we also, for instance, uh, uh, give a great priority to the problem of gypsies, Roma in, in uh, that part of the world, because it's the one minority that is really a uh, real mi minority issue. Education, I think, will, you know, a new leadership uh, in, in, in is already having some effect. Uh, um, uh, then... Uh, the education and the leadership, I didn't get that connection. No, that's, that's not, it, 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 takes, it goes away from your question because yeah. you asked about government. Uh, right. Uh, um, so coming back to government. Um, then the uh, empowering, then, then you basically uh, can agitate against uh, a bad government, um, and then you can reinforce a good government. You can't really overturn bad government. I think that goes beyond the capacity of the foundation. Um, but, but when you then have a change, a democratic change, uh, uh, the new government lacks capacity, and that is the worst aspect of it. And that's be, uh, because of that it fails. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look at what happened, in practically every country where you had a, this uh, break with the uh, the old regime, uh, new government, people coming in who had no experience in government. Right. Uh, well-meaning, idealistic, academic, uh, 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 no administrative skills, etc. Et, et messed it up. And usually the pendulum then swung back and you had a, a, a return to reform socialists or even not so reform uh, socialists. Uh, then they would fail and then maybe you'd get a new... Uh, uh, so, uh, um, uh, adding capacity to the 
to the, to uh, uh, well-meaning, well-intentioned, reform-minded government How do you can do be that? very powerful. How do you do that? You do it partly by providing them with with um, foreign experts who work for them, as distinct from foreign experts working for a, an international organization or for a donor. Like, uh, uh, so, um, uh, because that enables them to negotiate with those institutions and protect the interests of the country uh, against the interests of the, insti the institutional interests of the donors. That, that is a very, very important uh, element. You mean if you have a foreigner working for you as an expert, he can be a mediator or be helpful yeah. to you. Let me give, give you a, give you an example in Ukraine, which is not a success story. But when there was a change of government, uh, I offered them uh, to uh, brought in actually somebody called Anders Aslund, who's a, uh, who then worked for for the government negotiating with the IMF, and so within six weeks they had a program. See, otherwise it might not have happened. So that can be very, uh, and I'm trying that in also in Africa, um, uh, but that uh, I'm doing it with UNDP, and that is not working so well uh, for whatever reason, you know, UNDP and so on. But uh, that's not so successful. With but Mark, Mark Malik Brown. Mark yeah, Malik yeah, Brown, Because yeah. yeah. he's someone you've worked with before. Yeah, he he was he was sort of part of my he, he was very much my in my team. Then now right. he's at UNDP, so we try to work together, and we work very well. And some, we are doing some things, but then the bureaucracies don't mesh uh, quite so, quite so well. Uh, we have, for instance, given fellowships to uh, uh, people returning from abroad. Uh, who take a public uh, position, a pu pu public service. Uh, uh, if they work in a ministry or in local government or, or whatever. In countries like, for instance, Albania or Romania. You give them a fellowship to come study. To, to come back. To come we, give back. Them, we give them fellowships to go out, uh, maybe, or to go to the Central European University. But then uh, you also have to give them a fellowship to come back because uh, because they otherwise they couldn't be they wouldn't be properly paid. Right. So you have to give them, uh, uh, enable them to come back. I mean, it's not we don't give them princely salaries, but uh, sufficient for a graduate uh, to to attract him back if he's if he's interested. Uh, that is uh, also uh, uh, very successful. So you now have you know, several ministers in Albania, let's say, who came back that way. Um, I think the foreign minister and so on. Um, so that's another, uh, that's another effective way of, uh, this is now recognized actually. For instance, the British are doing it. Uh, the British are quite good in, in foreign aid and, and they are giving this kind of uh, support. Uh, establishing a judiciary, um, essential for for an open society, uh, but you have to pay them, and uh, otherwise they they have to take payment. So, uh, so um, uh, you have to have a. They have to take. They have to be corrupt. Pardon? Otherwise. otherwise, they have to take money under the. Yeah, yeah they have to. Be <coughs> Uh, so, for instance, in Georgia, uh, they did it with uh, World Bank uh, help, but the World Bank is not allowed to pay salaries that's against their rules, and so they actually had a, a, a very successful uh, uh, judiciary reform, um, where they had uh, professional selection. Uh, 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 testing for for the p position, and then uh, uh, a decent salary, and uh, you know since aid is fungible, uh, they could uh, uh, you know pay the salaries 
by getting paid for other things. But they couldn't maintain it. And so the whole thing is uh, now uh, eroding. Mm. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's a very interesting uh, situation because there was a major effort at uh, anti-corruption, which is, corruption is uh, atrocious. There was a major anti-corruption effort supported by the foundation, but also supported inside the government. You had the Minister of Justice, who was, a, I guess, a very good guy, and, and other people in the government, young people who had come back from abroad, uh, partly, you know, Soros uh, scholars and so on. Uh, and it came to very close to success in that it, it, it didn't, didn't make it, so they left the government now. Uh, they resigned from the, their post, but they were they were really introducing uh, uh, reforms. But one of the problems that they faced is that the judicial system, which had been reformed, was crumbling because the salaries could not be people were not the judges were not being paid. Mm. So, uh, so this kind of effort can be very very successful. And then you can have joint ventures with the, with the government, a reform-minded government, which is what we did, for instance, in Russia, uh, where we would contribute money and they would contribute the, the uh, franchise, let's say, of, <laughs> of education. Uh, so we had... Uh, uh, new textbooks, competition for new textbooks, mm -hmm. uh, sponsored, sponsored, it, and with a, and it was managed by a a, um, a um, joint task force, uh, which had the the min ministry represented, and the foundation represented. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it's a much more intrusive way of providing assistance than what international institutions are right. willing to do. What difference does it make to ha what difference does the quality of the head of the government make for this effort? Well, it, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's um, uh, night and day. I mean, you know, if you've got a, a, it makes all the difference, but the good guys know that they don't have a bureaucracy on which they can rely. So, for instance, the minister, the people in the education in, in, in Russia, they were eager that this thing should happen outside the ministry. Mm. Because if they did it with the ministry, it wouldn't get done. Or in Albania, let's say we, we had a program for building schools, they effectively built uh, schools. And, and uh, it was outside the ministry. Uh, because the ministry, even though, let's say you had a reform-minded minister, the bureaucracy, which is not paid, uh, has to do its own thing. Hmm. And so, it's, so the idea that just because you've got a new government, let's say in Ghana now, you've got a new government, it doesn't mean that they have got the mechanism mm -hmm. for delivery. In other words, they don't have civil service. Right. How do you help? that individual who come, takes over the government of Ghana or takes over mm. the Ministry of Education mm. in mm. Russia. Do, right. you, do you try to help that? Do you, you find somebody who's a good guy? Yeah, I'm very uh, basic, you know. And, and, you know, good guy, bad guy. Good guy, you help. Uh, bad guy, you don't help. Yeah, what do you do to help him? Hmm? What do you do to help him? What can the, what, what, what can be done that most help Well, uh, f first, uh, you, you meet his needs. Mm -hmm. In other words, what he wants to accomplish, and you help him uh, do it. Uh, you may give him some ideas of what he, m what he may want to do, and he may internalize it, uh, because you know, he didn't think of it, but he can see the, see the merit of it. Uh, so actually, you know, we, we have uh, kind of penetrated uh, some, some governments uh, quite, uh, 
quite to some, uh, quite some extent. Mm -hmm. um, with, uh, let's say, in Russia, they had a, a proposal to train people abroad. And it was a great idea. Yeltsin launched it, uh, but they didn't know how to implement it. So we actually gave a fellowship to somebody in the government to work on that. And uh, as a result, it was actually more useful mm -hmm. than it would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. So that's, cons that's uh, quite a bit of leverage. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't do that as a, uh, well, it's, well, you can do it maybe, but it's not, uh, 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 another government bureaucracy is not uh, well designed, not well positioned to do it, mm -hmm. because it is a matter of, uh, of personal uh, judgment. And and uh, and relationship uh, also, you know, there's a relationship of trust, and and the bureaucrats can't de develop that relationship because they don't have uh, the ability to deliver. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, hmm. what have you found uh, to be effective in dealing with corruption? Is it, is it, and how serious a problem is this for developing nations? Uh, I have not yet found anything that really is, is effective in dealing with corruption. Uh, I mean, if, if we came closest to it in Georgia, where, you know, uh, extremely corrupt regime, a well-meaning president, Shevardnadze, you know, uh, but uh, uh, Exhausted and 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 also beholden, and and captured in some ways, uh, and and personally at risk. The main source of corruption in the interior, the power ministries, the interior ministry, uh, and if we, which he cannot afford to offend because he depends on them for his own security. So uh, uh, it was the most. Uh, a comprehensive, well-developed, uh, implementable uh, program, which failed. Uh, but, you know, it was really, um, it was a, a, so, uh, involving civil society and everything, but it failed. This your program for open society? What? That was his Chevronazi's program. Well, this was uh, the program that we worked out with, your, with your them. Open society program. And you know, I used to, I went to to, uh, to Georgia, and uh, he finally, the day I arrived, he signed the decree, but th it wasn't implemented. Uh, so now the people uh, who were doing it uh, uh, left the government. Uh, I guess they'll contest. Uh, and maybe in th two years' time, they'll be able to implement it. But uh, that was, uh, t from my perspective, actually, w the, the, where I was the most deeply involved and where the foundation is, was most deeply involved. For instance, one of the board members became the head of the prison service. And so he was trying to break corruption inside prisons. And it was very interesting what he uh, told me about it. Uh, he didn't succeed. Uh, so uh, the answer is, so far, I mean, we are, you know, we, we're working on it, but uh, we have not, we have not uh, actually, uh, uh, I haven't seen any anti-corruption program that I could say really worked. Now, you know, maybe in Hong Kong there was, you know, that I don't know about. But in my personal experience, we have not succeeded. Do, do you think you were very far away from success or with some adjustments? If you would try it again, it, it might No, it no, might it's, it's alive. It's alive. It, you know, it's, it can, you know, uh, but it, I think uh, um, it would require uh, political, uh, these guys have to actually, uh, one of them has to become president. Mm -hmm. He has to run for president, and I think he will. He will. They'll do it. Hmm. But uh, you know, <laughs> they are not there. 
How serious a problem do you think corruption is? Tremendously serious. Tremendously serious. I mean, the other is another case where I, I saw success, but 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 um, it's not acknowledged. In Bulgaria, uh, the the um, prime minister actually made it a top priority to break uh, some of the mafia type structures. And he described to me in detail how he did it. He did it in uh, sugar and alcohol and natural gas. Uh, but, and, and I think he, he, uh, he actually did it. Nevertheless, the, uh, the government remained itself corrupt. Uh, there was corruption at uh, lower levels. Um, the ministry of, Minister of um, Economics uh, had to resign because of corruption. I personally believe he was not corrupt. In fact, I know he was not corrupt because he is working in an institute that I support. And if he had been corrupt, he wouldn't be working in an institute that I support. So I, I'm convinced he was not corrupt. He had to take responsibility for corruption in his, in, in his department. So there is a country that has not shaken the, the image of corruption uh, and has probably also not broken the reality of, of corruption. Yet considerable success was achieved in breaking certain elements of you see, mafia thing, and he described to me how he didn't use uh, he didn't use the judiciary system because it it, it was uh, it would leak it would uh, you couldn't rely on it. Uh, uh, um, he had a task force that was kind of uh, following the shipments and and uh, uh, interdicting them on the ground. So uh, I believe it was a successful program and yet it didn't break corruption as such. It just had some particular points of success. So that's mm. the, mm -hmm. that's the, sorry. Oh. Uh, okay. We, sh we should let you yeah. go. Yeah. This is very good. I, I'm, I'm, I, we can continue this, but I... Uh, well, we can continue if you yeah, just, just Well, I, had, I had just had a couple of questions about your own life, mm -hmm. if I might, uh, autobiographical questions. I'm curious, I know you don't call yourself a leader, but in fact you really have become a statesman, perhaps without a state. Mm -hmm. uh, about your own life, the de your own development, what, what moved you in the direction of wanting to bring social change, wanting to change things, and what was the sort of what were the? Well, I were think the, that was uh, that that was uh, that came from. It's a adolescent. That's yeah. an adolescent dream. Yeah. Uh, what did, yeah, where did that come from? Uh, adolescent dream. Do you, you, right. Maybe you had some. Maybe we you all had did. Some. We yeah. All so did. <laughs> uh, I would say I would say that uh, you know that was adolescent uh, stuff, uh, and then I got quite far away from it. And when I had been successful in making money, and I really reflected on what I care about, that's when I moved back to, to this area. So there was a, an in-between period of um, 30 years, let's say, or 25 years, when I was not at all engaged in doing good. Mm -hmm. At all, it was not. Uh, Did the, but coming back to that dream, mm -hmm. was it something that came out of your childhood in yeah, in uh, Budapest, or was it childhood? My father, my father. There's also a book. My father's memoirs are published now, and it's mm -hmm. a very good read. So mm -hmm. uh, 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 he comes alive in that. He was a very he was a, a formative uh, figure in my life, and he he, sh he shaped me. As fathers often do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. and and the the experience of your studying at LSE, how much influence did that have on you? So much is traced back to those days, 
and your discovery of Karl well, Popper. Uh, 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 well, of course, uh, uh, Popper, and, and it, it wasn't just Popper. I mean, right. uh, the, this, the philosophy, this uh, 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 reflexivity, that, that uh, of course, came in student uh, uh, years. And even when I went into business, I kept on working on it. So I wrote a, a philosophical treatise called The Burden of Consciousness uh, when I was working in, uh, here in the States as a trader. You know, so during the day I was, well, no, day and night I was trading, but on weekends I was, I, I was writing. So I had that interest, the phil philosophical interest. Mm -hmm. But that still came from, from uh, childhood. Hmm. Hmm. Your father's influence? No, no. That's well, more my mother's influence because my father was not a philosopher. Ah. Uh, no, he, he had a certain uh, practical. He was a pra he was a, um, a pragmatic person with uh, uh, strong moral values, but um, with a very personalized. Um, translation of those moral values. In, in, in other words, uh, uh, he went through a formative experience in the Russian Revolution. He lived through the Ruff Russian Revolution in Siberia. And, and that, you know, living in that chaos and turmoil uh, f shaped him, which then uh, prepared him <coughs> mentally for the uh, traumatic experience of the German occupation. And then the German occupation, when I was 14, was the formative experience in my life. In what sense? But, well, uh, because um, uh, you know, 14 years old, uh, your life is in danger, so you, it's adventure. You know, uh, it's uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, good fighting against evil. You know, my father being good, uh, uh, David and Goliath, outwitting the uh, the the, uh, the uh, this. Um, uh, so it's a um, fant it's a beautiful fantasy life if you come out ahead, which we did. Hmm. So hmm. that was a, and you know the. Uh, that was really your crucible. Yeah, that was that was it. That that was the formative experience, mm -hmm. and that's where um, most of my ideas also come. You see, with this, sure. with this, uh, you know, uh, far from equilibrium uh, uh, reversal, <coughs> you know, and so on. So it's it's um, so, well. There's a clear line between your fa your family facing yeah. Russian. T Totalitarianism yeah. facing German occupation, and then you're moving to an open society. Yeah, absolutely. Belief. Yeah, that's yeah. a clear line. It's a clear line, and even you know my particular involvement in Russia. Yes, it has to do with the fact that uh, I knew Russia from uh, sort of more or less uh, uh, from my father's milk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in other words, he lived through it and so on. Yeah. So I have a certain affinity with Russians. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so it's a personal thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, one last question. Yeah. Many young people today grow up in much more comfortable circumstances. Mm -hmm. They're not challenged in that mm -hmm. same way. How do we encourage the next generation to have this kind of commitment to social good, to social change? You came through it, you had to come through it the hard mm -hmm. way. Many mm -hmm. people in the Second World War generation, mm -hmm. the, the war was their defining yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it changed forever their view yeah. of how one changes society, what the importance of protecting and building a yeah. civil society. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, I, you know, I had this discussion with my children. I said, you unfortunate creatures, you, yeah. you, you, know, you, you have it too good. Mm -hmm. uh, and they feel it in a way, you know, that, that uh, because <coughs> uh, they had their, they, they they have their their own problems uh, how to deal how to relate to their father how to you know and so on but it's not it doesn't have this um, heroic quality when you are actually up against reality right and it's 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 uh, um, it's uh, it's very hard and I. Uh, 
uh, I don't know. I think that uh, that um, uh, probably um, we can trust uh, to history that uh, things won't be that good. You see that uh, mm -hmm. there'll be there'll be opportunity for for people to experience <laughs> 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 injustice and so on. and 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 people do actually in their in their personal life. I mean, you know, in my case, it was sort of historical things, but uh, an abusive uh, father, for instance, uh, it can be a, or a, 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 a take Clinton. Mm -hmm. uh, how was Clinton form, formed, you know? There was a clear family situation. Right, right. So I think, uh, uh, and, and people react to it, uh, uh, in different ways. Some want to be different and others uh, uh, want to emulate the, <laughs> the, the... So I don't, I don't think there is an answer. I don't, I don't think... I, I, and I think that, that unless um, uh, uh, people feel, uh, uh, feel it, uh, I don't think you can really inculcate it. I, uh, um, but it's interesting, for instance, in, in England, which is a very comfortable society, uh, there is a, or in, in Sweden, uh, it is also very, uh, there's a, a, a real, a real interest in uh, problems in other parts of the world, exactly because uh, for some people, uh, prosperity can be very dull. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at it, the Nordic countries have been the best in their, in their engagement in uh, development problems. And, and, and the British have been very uh, uh, receptive to, to dissidents and, and so on. So I don't think it's so bad to, to, to be prosperous. I, I'm not, I wouldn't be worried too, too much about <laughs> <in my> prosperity. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Very good.